Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you some of the major news developments from across the world. Our headlines Protests in Minneapolis intensify after police repression, one death report. US ends waivers to China, Russia, and other countries on Iran sanctions. Workers at South Africa's Mux Steel factories decide to strike against pay cuts. New wave of protests hits Algeria over the arrest of activists. We begin with an update on the situation in Minneapolis in the United States, where protests continue after the murder of George Floyd. Things have intensified as the police clash with the protesters. One protester is reported to have died because of a shooting incident, while one has been arrested by the police. The circumstances behind the death of the protester is not known yet, neither is the identity of the perpetrators. There were also reports of a Target store being raided by the protesters after they were refused permission to buy milk for those hit by tear gas shells from the police. Protests were especially intense at the 3rd Precinct Office of the Minneapolis Police. This is the precinct where the four police officers accused of Floyd's murder were serving. While the mayor of Minneapolis has assured a federal investigation into the death of Floyd, the police officers are yet to be indicted. Protesters have been demanding that the officers be charged and arrested for their crimes, which was recorded live by several eyewitnesses and went viral over the social media. Early this morning, US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced the end of the last sanctions waiver provided to Iran under the 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or the Iran nuclear deal. According to this waiver, a few Russian, Chinese and European firms were allowed to work at certain Iranian nuclear sites despite the sanctions. Despite unilaterally withdrawing from the JCPOA or the nuclear deal in 2018, the US had continued to renew these exemptions every 60 days. However, Pompeo announced that after the expiry of the current 60 days period, companies working on sites in Iran will be subjected to sanctions in the United States. The US continues what it, what it calls its maximum pressure campaign against Iran and has imposed several fresh sanctions despite the appeals from the international community. Iran has been one of the worst affected countries by the COVID-19 pandemic and the sanctions have hampered its ability to contain the outbreak in the country. This month, the US has also tried to extend the UN arms embargo on Iran set to expire in October as per the nuclear deal. It even went to the extent of threatening to snap back all pre-2015 sanctions on Iran. In our next story, members of the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa or NUMSA and Mux Steel's produ production units in South Africa have embarked on a strike action beginning today. The workers are protesting the company's unilateral decision to cut their salaries by 20%. Described on its website as Africa's leading steel supplier, Mux Steel produces a variety of steel and aluminium products for different use in different sectors. Businesses expected to be hit by the strike action include Mux Steel coil processing, exports, fluid control, roofing, special steels, trading, tube and pipe, and Mux Steel VRN. NUMSA has accused the management of using the pandemic as a pretext to attack workers' rights. The union has further alleged that Mux Steel has not applied for Temporary Employment Relief Scheme or TERS. The scheme helps distressed companies pay their workers' wages during the COVID-19 emergency. TERS is funded to the Unemployment Insurance Fund that requires mandatory contributions made by employees and employers of any companies, re companies registered with it. Any company which has made this contribution regularly is eligible to apply for financial assistance under TERS. Not applying for this scheme indicates that there have been irregularities in the UIF contributions. In the meanwhile, Maxteel has claimed that NUMSA's strike is unprotected and has threatened workers with retaliation. In our next story, Algeria is witnessing a fresh round of anti-government protests since Monday. Protests under the banner of the Hirak movement, stage rallies and demonstrations in cities across Algeria. Despite the restrictions in force in the country due to the coronavirus pandemic, as well as a ban on holding public demonstrations, the anti-government protests were held in major cities, coinciding with the Eid al-Fitr celebrations. The protests were organized to show solidarity and extend support to the prominent members of the Hirak movement who have been imprisoned or detained by the authorities. According to the National Committee for the Liberation of Prisoners, there are currently close to 50 activists imprisoned for their involvement in the protests last year. Just last week, three Algerian opposition activists were given lengthy prison sentences on the basis of their social media posts on Facebook. In our InFocus section, we bring you an interview with Kenya al an activist and an organizer, with Union de Vecinos, an organization in Los Angeles, California, and she talks about the issues regarding rent in the country and in the city, especially issues faced by migrant workers. Uh, hi, and welcome to People's Dispatch. Today we are joined by Kenya Alcocer, who is an organizer with Union de Vecinos in Los Angeles, California. 
Um, this organization works around a lot of issues relating to housing and amid the pandemic and lockdown, the organization has been very active in organizing and calling for the cancellation of rent. So thank you, Kenya, so much for joining us. The Union de Vecinos has issued a very clear demand of food, not rent. Um, the organization has called for rent strikes. It has called for the cancellation of rent. And this is something we're seeing in the US, not only in Los Angeles, but also by organizations on a national level um, and across the country. So why has the demand for the cancel cancellation of rent become so pressing? The reason why it's because we don't see a future for tenants to keep their homes if they are in debt um, to their landlords. Um, a lot of our community members had to go on rent strike on April 1st because they didn't have money to pay for April's rent. Um, we're in May. It doesn't seem like it's going to be any um, anytime soon that we're going to be able to have the communities actually go back to work and receive full payment of not just what they missed of work, but for them to continue to um, survive for the following months. Um, so rent cancellation is very important for us because it tells people that it is not okay for people to be in debt. Um, um, we know that there are a lot of our community members that are already in debt, um, whether it's credit cards um, or student loans. Um, so adding another debt onto communities and onto folks, it's, it's very, very, um, it lives them, lives them in a very precarious um, situation. If we say people go into rental agreements um, where they start paying rent um, to landlords and they sign this document, then that really tells tenants that if for whatever reason um, they're not able to pay that rent, then they will go through a, an eviction proceedings and lose their home anyway. So it doesn't, it doesn't really solve the issue of people um, not losing their homes. And that is why rent forgiveness is the best way for people and anybody to be um, really safe in their homes during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and the food not rent actually calls on to really prioritize different things during this moment. Food, it's more essential right now than paying your rent is. Um, feeding your family is more essential. Um, and that is where we're also trying to like really push back against this essential worker narrative. Although, yes, we understand that there are workers that, um, thanks to them, we are surviving through this pandemic. There, there's also need to be an understanding that those workers' um, safety nets are not being protected, which is housing, um, health care, and even workers' rights and salaries. Um, if the worker is essential, then his necessities need to be essential as well. Um, and that is what the push for Food Not Rent is actually also talking about. Awesome. So um, amid this context, what is the organizing by Union de Vecinos and other uh, community organizations look like? And also what are the, Amid this organizing, what are the de what are the demands that have emerged um, to the state government, the federal government, and from the organizations themselves? So, Unión de Vecinos, um, we are in Bull Heights and East LA, which are very um, predominantly Latino immigrant communities. Um, we have a lot of our membership that are in the informal economy sector. Um, there are there street vendors, mariachis. Um, we have folks that um, that babysit um, other community members, kids. So there is not. Uh, oh, and then for the most part, a lot of our workers are also garment workers. So on the former sector, they're either garment workers, they're fast food workers. Um, retail. So all these jobs that are um, low wage jobs for the most part. Um, so one of the reasons why this um, trying to push this through, um, it wasn't, a, like I said, a no brainer. A lot of our members came on April and said, you know what, we're not going to be able to pay our rent. For us as Union de Vecinos working with tenants for many, many years, we know and working with lawyers that defend tenants that we know that 
the first thing that you need to do is document to protect yourself and start documenting in case you do go to eviction court. Um, so for us, it was like, okay, we need to start documenting this. So sending your letter to your landlord saying, I've been impacted by this COVID-19 health and economic crisis, and I'm not going to be able to pay this month's rent actually helps tenants out in the process of like, when we do go to court, um, we have something to back up these tenants, um, um, case in order for us to win some of these cases. Um, and the other thing that we also have a, a clear understanding on is courts and this particular system doesn't have the ability to evict every single person. They're going to have to do some negotiations even within court. Um, there are 70,000 cases, eviction cases that go through one court here in LA, which is Stanley Moss Court, um, every year. Uh, if they were to do something like this, I mean, it would be very difficult and very drastic to evict. We have in, in the city of Los Angeles, 62% of the population are tenants. Mm -hmm. And this is just the city of LA. If we were really going to go through a process of evicting every single person that didn't pay their rent, it would have been nearly impossible to go through the court system, one, and it would be impossible for the sheriff's department, who are the executors of those court um, processes, to lock out every single person in the city of LA. Um, so we're also utilizing this as tenant power to really bottleneck and push a system that has been for a very long time an oppressive system against um, poor communities. Um, we are, we're also under um, operating under the understanding that there is uh, that this housing crisis didn't start with the pandemic; that it was an existing housing crisis. Um, in the in the United States, we had we had um, before the crisis the numbers were 10 million um, houseless folks in the community, so homeless. Um, folks in, in our communities, um, and 18 million vacant housing. And th this is the felt um, aftermath uh, after the 2008 housing crash. So there is a clear understanding that there is housing. Here in LA, you go to poor communities like East LA or South Central, and you see empty houses that are still owned by the banks that they were foreclosed on. Mm -hmm. Houses that could be utilized right now to house people during this pandemic, because one of the things that has been essential to, to um, put this curve down has been people staying in their homes. Mm -hmm. But what happens to those that don't have homes? So mm -hmm. we have organizations here that have been amazing, like the California Homeless Union and others, that their job has been to push and really um, demand for all these vacancies to be utilized during this moment, especially um, not just the housing that has been foreclosed or housing that is currently vacant, but also these hotels and motels in the community. We have um, a lot of vacancies there. So one of the things that we are trying to figure out, it's like, how do we start pushing our government and our local officials at every single level, locally, statewide, and nationally, to really start thinking about the ability of housing every single individual? We know that that is a possibility. Um, and one of the things that we're also realizing is that within, we are also part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And one of the things that it's not just a, uh, a policy issue is also a moral issue. At, at this moment of time, when we're talking about people dying, it is okay for some some of our government officials, it's okay for them for poor people to die. Um, and that is something that we're also pushing back. The no paying rent campaign, it's also a campaign of telling people not to not put anything into the system that is, that is actually um, wanting them to die. Going to work earlier on the stage means the possibilities of you catching this disease and bringing it back to your community, to your home. So um, it is pushing back. It's, it's something that we're, we're thinking about like more critically, even with our community members, it's a process of, um, where we're actually engaging in more political education um, of talking of like, why are we going back to work for, or why are we paying rent? And the little relief that people are receiving from federal governments or statewide governments, it's so insignificant in reality. I mean. I believe it was like what um, twelve hundred dollars um, if per um, adult, and then five hundred dollars per children. 
well, that could be just what you receive. It's just one month's rent. Mm -hmm. And that's it. If that. Um, and if, if that, yeah. And if you pay that uh, uh, money, then where are, where are you going to find the money for food? Where are you going to find the money for medication? And those are the things that we need to start prioritizing. I mean, a lot of the things that we're also saying with this campaign, it's no, we don't want to put our money into the pockets of our corporate landlords or back into the banks. Mm -hmm. This money needs to stay in the community to secure the community survival. Um, we are pushing for something that it's more realistic for community members. One of the things that our community members that are, those essential workers are getting sick and we're feeling the effects of that. In, in Texas, a lot of um, folks that are working in the meat packing industry mm -hmm. are getting sick Therefore, all these meat companies are closing down. Well, in California, the meat has price has doubled in, for the most part. So even food is becoming more expensive during this time. And if you're having to choose between paying a huge amount for food and then having nothing left from your rent, then that is a problem. A lot of our community members here in L.A. are paying 60 to 75 percent of well, actually more, 60 to 80 percent of their income is going into rent or into housing. And that is something that we are also talking about. It's, it's, that's not fair. We know that folks that live in public housing are paying only 30 percent of their income. Um, and there are some protections for those folks. But again, like housing has been something that has not been prioritized. Even public housing is something that has been dismantled um, a lot across the nation. Um, a lot of folks that are poor are now being um, forced to to work um, if they want to continue to live in public housing. Um, public housing has been um, disinvested from. It has been attacked in the sense that mixed income families are being evicted from public housing. Um, I'm sorry, mixed um, immigrant status families. That's all we have in this episode of the International Daily Roundup. To know more about these stories, visit our website peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching. Yeah,